Servus, Matthias here, and I am inviting you to travel to faraway lands with me for this episode of Single Track. No, I'm kidding, not really that far away, but for many of us trail runners here on the West Coast, the East Coast seems far, far away. That's what's so great about the virtual races. It brings people together who otherwise wouldn't be able to meet. And this week, I'm talking to Lou Donofrio from Philadelphia, who ran the Virtual Vert Challenge, and we get to chat about his race, his running story, and the trails he calls home. We learn about ultra races most have never heard of, a running community that meets over pretzels and beer and runs along historic trails and rivers. But speaking of races, just a quick shout out that the early bird pricing is ending March 31st for Rock Candy Running's Little Backyard Adventure 6-Hour Challenge. The race is happening on August 6th right here in Olympia at LBA Park, and I'm super stoked about the new format this year. Four mile loop, six hours. Come and challenge yourself, run one loop, run three, or push yourself to the max. It will be a great summer party in these incredible woods right here in the city of Olympia. Visit littlebackyardadventure.com for all the info and come race with us at the Little Backyard Adventure six hour challenge. And now, Join me on this high-speed train as we travel the country and visit some East Coast woods and run the twisted trails over gnarly rocks and roads. And here is Lou. Thank you for coming on Single Track. This is very exciting because you are one of the Virtual Vert Winter Challenge finishers, and that's how we met. And I'm excited yes. to have you on the show, um, not just to hear about you, who you are, but also to hear about how your race went. So welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. Happy to be here. So, so, so I need to admit something. You know, there's always a big like West Coast and East Coast bias, and I try to avoid uh -huh. this. But yeah. I'm on the West Coast, and I have to admit, I think you are the first person I'm interviewing from the East Coast, which is embarrassing. Uh, well, I mean, I'm I'm thrilled. Then it's a, quite an honor. <laughs> You're the first East Coast person on the on the show. So, yeah, no, I just, I'll represent the East Coast well, but I'm, I'm myself, you know, I mean, I like to get out to the West Coast when I can, but, uh, but, but I love it out here. It's, it's great. Happy to share some of it with you. G give us a little bit of a, a feeling. Where are you from and, and where do you run? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I live in southeastern Pennsylvania, um, probably about 10, 15 miles west of Philadelphia. And so, you know, a lot of my running is, is around here. Um, you know, it changes pretty, pretty quickly once you, once you start going West, I mean, out, out of the city, I'm in, I'm in, you know, really a suburban area, but we're lucky to have a lot of parks around. And, um, I do a lot of training at a state park called Ridley Creek state park. Um, and it, it runs adjacent to an arboretum called Tyler Arboretum. Um, and in there, you know, there are miles and miles of trails. I mean, if you, it's, it's not as vast as it, as things are out West, but if you, you know, know the right areas and can kind of be creative with your sort of loops and out and backs and stuff, you can easily put together double digit runs, 20 milers or whatever, all on trail. Um, and so I do a lot of running on trail here. Um, of course, just with time wise and like family and jobs and stuff, I'll, I'll definitely run roads. And I, I kind of like running roads too. Um, I'll run a little bit on the track for some speed, but I definitely do a lot of hill, hilly runs, you know, um, probably like 100 feet per mile kind of thing. So rolly. So if you were to do like a 10 mile run, you'd get about a thousand feet of vert. And that's kind of common for it around here in this part of Pennsylvania, especially just, you know, just it's always hilly. It's just up or down. And the ups and downs are, are shorter and smaller, but you know, so we could, we could probably spend an hour talking about, you know, the training differences of, of like a really long hill or, or ascent versus the shorter up and down stuff. But that's where that is. I do some running up on the Appalachian Trail um, in Schuylkill County and Berks County in the Hamburg area with some friends. I try to get up there once a week or once every couple weeks. And there you can get some larger hills, some longer climbs, um, you know, maybe like 800 feet in in about a mile or more or less depending on the area um so that's where i run in in pennsylvania um but you know i we're fortunate that I, my wife and i finally put it together and we have a condo in vermont so when i can get up to vermont i can get some bigger climbs and kind of central vermont 
Um, and that's kind of like, you know, where I, where I run here, it's, there are a lot of trees. Um, it's a little different from like where you are. If I know, like when I ran Badger Mountain 100, you know, there weren't any trees and we've got just different varieties of forests here. So, you know, where we are here, it's not as dense, a little bit more dense up in Vermont. But when you've got runs and trails through trees in a forest, you're going to have, like I'm sure you may have heard, it's scraggly, it's a, it's a lot of roots, generates a lot of mud. Um, it's twisty and curvy in a lot of places. Um, and, you know, and Pennsylvania is famously known for rocks. We don't have as many as they have up, you know, in, in some of the northern sections on the AT, but some places, you know, we can affectionately name it Roxylvania and, you know, and AT through hikers will call it Roxylvania and they'll eat up their sneakers and stuff. So, yeah, so it's kind of like scraggly trails. It's, it's not as buffed out. A lot of climbs up and down, a lot of forests. It, sound, it yeah. sounds, and the forests are then, and now I don't have the, the, the perfect uh, biological term. You've got far forests where the leaves fall in the fall, right? Right. Because we have right. evergreen forests over yep. here where um, for most parts, especially, you know, if you head yeah. out a little bit, um, yeah, the, the forests don't really change that much, which is not quite true. But over uh, where you were at, you've got forests where the leaves fall and it dramatically changes in the wintertime. Yeah. I think I think that word Matthias is deciduous. There we go. You see, I I, I didn't want to make that mistake of saying the wrong word, so I let I let you take the lead on that. There, one. Perfect. There, there's the East Coast uh, expertise. There, that's so my big word for the podcast. So we're done now. <laughs> that's that's amazing. So yeah, so yeah, you know, and that creates its own dynamic. You know, where you have like in the fall kind of period, and you know, if you were to have like a like a fast um trail race you know a non-ultra or something if you were to be racing like a 10k or 20k or something and so you're really revving up the speed you know those leaves will be will be a dynamic and part of the race because they're going to cover up the rocks and the roots and they'll also if it was wet they'll be slippery so you know that definitely adds its own dynamic to like racing on that kind of terrain with those leaves but yeah and i do yeah. hear that People are saying that East Coast trails, why you don't, while you don't have the insanely long, steep climbs, are more technical, mm -hmm. right? That's what I'm right. hearing. Yeah, that's you know, and like for me, like I, I've been out by you, and I, I try to, I've been out to Utah a bunch, um, Colorado, and and I think it, it is true. It's it's definitely more technical here on the East Coast. You know, the the West Coast, the climbs and descents could be longer for sure. And you have the altitude. Um, but here it's, again, it's like twist. I don't know if it's the, the type of forest or just the, the nature of the terrain and stuff, but the trails are, they're not as like the, the mud and muck is thicker. It's not as sandy in a lot of places, at least like where I am. It's not as, it's like dirt it can be wet dirt. Um, and it's going to be twisty, like, you know, 10 feet cut right straight 10 feet cut left so twisty around trees and whatever and you're up and you're down quickly and then like with the with the roots and the small and smaller various size rocks you're just constantly bouncing around whereas i feel like when i've at least the trails i've been on out west the um the footing type terrain has been a little smoother and maybe a little little straighter just differences in their own way both both a lot of fun and really cool and pre present their own kind of I have absolutely absolutely no idea what the reasons for that is, but I would love to yeah. know if it, you know, if it's a mixture of different kind of soils that right. erosion happens different, and probably in some places yeah. that is a factor. And then I wonder yeah. too of history, right? I mean, if so many trails that we consider hiking trails now out west, where old mining routes or farmstead trap routes or some some yeah, you know. Animal Animal, animal tracks yeah. and so they and sometimes they're more direct if you will right. um it, it's, it's yeah. just sort of a different thing and i don't know in what way that has an impact on it but it, i think this kind this kind of stuff is is super fascinating especially because i'm from yeah. germany where we where you then come with a whole different level of history when it comes to trails and right. routes and how things are connecting and stuff i think it's it's fascinating because you don't think yeah. about it when you tie your on your sneakers and you go on a run but there is right. 
there is some history that sort of kind of um, created these these routes that yeah. we now consider you know famous running routes yeah you're right i mean you that you might be onto something there especially well i mean on one hand with the, with the different soils and and just plant life that's around it probably the the altitude and weather conditions. yeah exactly uh, you know like what can live and where and then also like you said maybe maybe on the east coast we've got you know you have more like man-made systems of course there are man-made systems out west but like you said more maybe even animal and and herd um rancher type migrations and people are running on those but yeah yeah interesting stuff amazing well so now tell me so my virtual challenge obviously you could join from anywhere and um usually i've got a bunch of germans joining in too but they were all decided to be busy this weekend which i uh, was very upset about no how did you this is a question that only is i'm interested in but how did you find out about uh, um that i'm putting on a virtual race I, th- I think I saw it somewhere when all the virtual things were going on, like in the heyday of the pandemic, just different. For- you probably had some virtual challenges back. Yes. Back then. Right. And so I think I think I would just somehow got on your somehow got on your e-blast list. Nice. <laughs> well, perfect. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. So somehow that happened. And and uh, at first I was I wondered that, too. I'm like, I wonder if it was like a connection to Badger or whatever. But it, I think it might have been just from um the e-blast list yeah. from like the pandemic and i but then i saw this one and it kind of fit we can talk about that but you know it just kind of fit and sounded like something fun to do over the over the weekend so i love it no it's it's in yeah. int- i remember uh, what two years ago almost when i was tracking my brain trying to come up with a formula and obviously n- having never run this formula i sort of and i'm not a good data modeler but having to sort yeah. of figure out how do you do something that has never done before in terms of creating this formula that can consider possible edge cases, right? Because yeah. you don't want to come up with a math, with math and then somebody figures out, oh, you know, if I actually um, run flat but lots of miles, then my effort per whatever result will be really high or something, right? I mean, there is a way right, that right. you could have potentially right. cheated the formula right. if you didn't think about it. So I remember putting it t- together and fretting over how to do it but speaking of the kind of trails that you have around is exactly why i wanted a challenge like that and obviously during the height of the pandemic virtual challenges made a lot more sense because all real races were canceled and people didn't travel very far so you needed sort of your neighborhood hill but i wanted to create something that gave people an ability to just yeah take your neighborhood hill and sort of challenge yourself on it and level the playing field right because if somebody has a 2000 foot hill out their backyard they um well i mean they you know they have something great but they shouldn't have automatically a big advantage over somebody who lives in a place that's a little bit more flat so this worked well for you yeah and i just um and you know for that one i was on I did, I did a road hill near me. Um, I could have done a trail near me, but the, but some of the trails, like you said, that I was thinking about doing initially were longer. And so, and in my mind, like when I said, I really used it as more of like, just like a training run, like with a goal, you know? And so I didn't, I didn't want it to be, you know, super big miles where I'd be, you know, like super sore the next day or, or whatever. Um, I wanted to kind of, cause my, actually my, my training that day was only supposed to be like 15 or so miles and i think i ended up doing like 23 just to hit because i i wanted to hit 100 i felt like that was like a good round number and then i lost track of one or two hill repeats i was trying to keep track of them on my phone but i couldn't you know like sometimes you just space you know just like zone out and i couldn't remember so i I ended up with like 104 but that was really just because i forgot if i had done x like 39 40 or 41 repeats um, but I was just shooting for a hundred, and like you said, it's creative there. It's a pretty cool formula. I like it because it's kind of like a good gauge of miles, hills, and vert. Um, and you really have to play around with it, you know. Because I had some when I was thinking about getting to a hundred beforehand. Some of the hills that I could have selected wouldn't have gotten me there, even though they were might might have given me more vert kind of thing, you know, or or they might have given me like 
you know, I could have had like more repeats, but then less miles and I, then I wouldn't have hit my mileage total. So that, that hill like was really the best selection to get to that hundred number and combine the, the vert with the training and um, the vert with the uh, mileage and the number of hills. So I thought it was, it was cool. It worked out to be like, and plus, you know, you don't want it to be, I, I liked how you put on there at the, um, the data entry point that the hill should be somewhere around a hundred feet, you know, at least because you don't want to have the, the only I could see potential issue with your formula is you could have somebody do like 210 foot hills or something, you know, and then, and, and get like run, like, you know, whatever that three miles and not a lot of vert, but they, they would then get like 200 points. So you have to have, I think like the minimum, a minimum uh, feet of climb per hill. But then once you have that, it's just wherever it is and it kind of works itself out with the gain and the miles. Yeah, no, exactly. I remember last year, the first time around, somebody did it in a staircase of a um, parking garage. Right. And it was sort of on the edge of being questionable. But you, A, number one, if the hill's too short, you run into the fact that you can't track it because your GPS doesn't right. see the hill. So, um, right. and and you you sort of lose your mind too. Like it works yeah. actually against you, right? You can be yeah. really smart and like, this would be the best way of like <laughs> fucking with the formula. And then you're like, oh yeah. wait, I'm actually just fucking with myself here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you need yeah. to find be... something that's a good balance. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. And it would be, you know, kind of lame to do that many, to purposely do that many repeats. It's tough. I think that's part of the problem with some of the virtual challenges that that involved gain. And I know, like I did, I did one or two of them over the over the uh, pandemic too. And I think that if you do it, it wasn't really a problem in yours because everybody was outside. But if you were going to give people the ability to, like you said, use a stairwell, if someone didn't have any hills but had a treadmill, right? Then they could use a treadmill, but the treadmill vert should be its own category in a, in any like vert challenge. It should be like treadmill vert, outside vert, and then maybe some kind of hybrid where, you know, you're doing both and it doesn't matter what the percentage is, but you really can't combine like somebody who's doing, whether it be road or trail, a hill repeat where you're going up and going down and spending miles and time on your feet going down with, you know, a situation where you're like on the treadmill, just going up. You know, or like in, in your situation with the uh, with the staircase example where, you know, you are going up and down, but it's it's just it's like specifically tailored to super quick up kind of thing. It's if it's it's just different when you've got to go up and down a hill, you know, yeah. so. Well, and I mean, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm not really I'm not handing trophies out to the winners, why I just yeah. have a whole bunch of prizes that I'm raffling off. Because yeah, in the end, it's supposed to be a challenge. And I didn't yeah. want to run into this where somebody was saying, well, I looked at that person's Strava and actually he miscalculated. And, you yeah, know, yeah, I mean, it's really yeah. meant to be a personal challenge the way really most yeah. races are. Right. I mean, unless yeah. you are somebody who's competing um, on a semi-pro professional level and you need to be in the top five so I run far interviews you or something, right? Because your sponsor right. demands it. It's really sure. about what you want to, how you want to challenge yourself and mm -hmm. how far how far you want to push yourself. Like I yeah. was debating going back to the same hill that I previously did it just to s compare myself against myself. But I desperately yeah. wanted to do it on trails and I found yeah. one where I could go up on trails and yeah. then down on a forest road on, on a gravel yeah. road. Oh, so cool. I can be fast on the road down. Right. Right. And then the uphill would be nice and diverse yeah. and steep and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Yours was good too. You had, you and I had the same total. That was cool. I think we played the same game that we definitely yeah. wanted to yeah. reach hit a hundred and yeah. then we miscalculated and we had to put a buffer in <laughs> because it would have been absolutely <laughs> yeah. devastating if we would have ended, so ended up at 98, right, right? Oh yeah, it would have been, yes, you're exactly <laughs> right. If I got home and saved it and then cal did the formula and I would have, I would have been pretty frustrated there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice job. Well, thank you. So, um, thank you for, for joining the challenge. 
Hey, tell, tell, tell us a little bit how it was out there because I mean, you know you know no matter what you do you're spending a few hours on sort of the same the same <laughs> road yeah. section over and over again right yeah well that's cool i'm glad you asked that because i thought about that a little bit you know with, with the the challenge and then like when you kind of sent me what you were thinking about and i thought see it's fine really and that's something i would say to people you know i mean because i've been you know running official ultras now for you know since 2011 and i just that time on your feet you know i mean i probably spent like four something hours and that's just going up and down and you know that's not a huge amount of time but it's like that's a decent it's a decent chunk on a on a saturday and really the thing is to to do that and then and then be good to get back at it again the next day or take or take a rest day and just stay consistent with your training and not and try not to push it over the edge and find that line of, you know, solid, consistent training with rest, but just that you keep at it in the, in the long run. And sometimes the, like the monotony of, you know, that hill repeat or that amount of time or whatever, you know, is really good training in and of itself because, you know, a lot of people, especially newer to the sport, are kind of like, you know, trying to wrap their minds around you know how am i going to go that far how am i going to be out there for that long or you know this and that really and and so many as you know it's it's simple but it's complex and a lot of things go into it but then part of it is just you know you need to just be out there and find your flow and just enjoy the moment and just enjoy the movement and really from and really for me that's that's kind of like what it was you know i had as we talked about i had a goal i wanted to hit that number it was part of a broader training program and it was kind of, I was kind of like, I didn't exactly know how it was going to shake out, you know, how much time it would be, but I had a general idea of how many miles and stuff. And I was just like, if I'm here for two and a half hours, three and a half hours, four and a half hours, five hours, you know, whatever, I'm just going to, I'm just going to hit that number and feel good and listen to some tunes and eat some food and enjoy this, enjoy the ride, enjoy the afternoon and, you know, for us, like we've, um, my wife, Heather and I have, you know, two kids. And so, you know, I had things I was going to do that afternoon, um, after it's some family things, but I, I had the, that chunk of time free and that was a good way to use it. I had, um, logistically, I had like some water and, um, hammer gels with me, you know, hammers is a sponsor of mine. So I had some hammer gels and some, some mango fizz and I kind of like didn't run with my pack since that's one of the beautiful things about a hill repeat is, yes. you know, you know, right. Yeah. 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 So, so I had, I had my pack kind of like on a tree and like at a, on a mound by a tree. And, um, and in so, sometimes you want to run, you know, with your full pack, which can be good training, but there was really no reason to do it there, especially when I was going to pass it, you know, 80 times. Um, Right. And, uh, and, and be, and also because I was accessible, uh, which was nice. My, my great wife, Heather was also my crew chief. A lot of times dropped off some, some snacks for me. <laughs> so I had some snacks, uh, some, you know, potato chips. Um, and that was a nice little treat. So that's kind of like what I did. I just had like a mini, you know, when you, when you do these ultras, you think like logistics like that. And so I just kind of had like this very mini aid station under a tree and I just grab some hydration and gels and chips, you know, over the course of the time. I, I love the way you just described that because yeah. that's really exactly what I envision for this, because as you're saying, um, people think the monotony is insane, but it's actually not so bad. It is good training. Yeah. And if you are, yeah. Um, if you pick a good route and you're away from traffic, you can just be in that zone where you can listen to music. I, for the first half, I listened to some podcasts and eventually was like, okay, you know, now it's starting to get yeah. real. Let's to, uh, switch to some music. And yeah. being able to build your own aid station um, yeah, I mean, yeah, means you don't have to run with your pack, which is nice for a training run, but you also... Yep sort of thinking a little bit about okay how do i set this up and so it, it is the perfect sort of description of how this can be done really well i sort of halfway through went back down to my car and refueled there because i didn't want to leave my stuff just lying in the woods where i was and so yeah, uh, yeah. But, but my car wasn't very far so it was fine and 
by yeah. going down to the car and going back up, I only added a few more feet of vert, so it worked out well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so well, no, it's plus, it's perfect perfect description. Yeah, yeah, and plus for something like that, you know, the miles would would be part of your equation anyway, because it wasn't like you were racing the time. So exactly, exactly. And I think the only challenge is that you when you put something like this out you don't really know how long it takes because you so rarely do hill repeats on that level and so we don't really have a good formula of um okay this is going to take me 3 hours or 5 hours right um yeah. like i thought at a mi minimum i currently very low on training and so i thought at a minimum i'd do 3 hours and 4 hours was a stretch dose goal and then by the time i was approaching 4 i was like i'm not feeling in any way fatigued i can just keep going and yeah um and so i pushed in so it is one of those things that we ha don't really have on our list of of calculations of how how to do it but um yeah, yeah and then the other thing you mentioned that i think is really great is the accessibility that you mm -hmm. people know where you're at so you're not running some gigantic loop um right so so people are able to to drop things off for you if you need to and stuff so it's great yeah yeah and you know when when you do that like the neighbors come out too i had these people stop by and ask me what i was doing <laughs> Which, you know we've all experienced that <laughs> no absolutely i've the first one um like two years ago i did a hill in a, a neighborhood and halfway through it rained so hard that i actually ran home and changed my clothes and just left my um, watch running and then ran back out to the hill. But halfway through the Love bottom it. of the hill, friends of mine, um, they have a their house there and they have a sauna. And they're like, it's so wet and cold. Do you want to jump into the sauna? I'm like, man, that sounds very tempting. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I would have gotten back out. <laughs> right. Good like, for you for resisting it. That's I know, good. right? That was harsh. Beware the chair. <laughs> Beware of the chair. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's why loop loop course, you know, like a multiple loop course kind of thing can be tough in that regard. Um, because, you know, it gives you, on the one hand, it gives you easy access to aid. But on the other hand, it's so many opportunities to just, you know, call it and grab a beer. No, it is true. I ran 100K last year in May. Um, yeah, June or so, and um, I was able to get third place because I was because oh, everybody congrats. yeah thank you because awesome. everybody dropped out because was it was fun. they offered a fifty mile fifty k fifty mile hundred yeah. k and hundred mile and the weather was pretty bad at night and yeah. it, it literally everybody basically said okay fifty miles is enough for me so they uh, so many dropped. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do one more loop. Come hello, high water. Right. And so um, yeah, it, is, well, it is true that it is very tempting to to give up on, on these courses. <laughs> yeah, and that's part of the race. You know, that's part of strategy with a, with an endurance event or an ultra marathon, like in that kind of format. Yeah, so, no, for sure. Job. So thank you. So beyond um, virtual challenges, <laughs> what, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about – what other races you're running? What your what your ultra running? I don't want to call it career. That sounds so professional. Yeah. But why not? Career looks a like career, looked yeah, like. That's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah, thanks for asking. So I'm kind of I feel like I was just talking to, you know, my coach about this and just kind of explaining it. I mean, I I'm kind of like a, I I really consider myself a versatile endurance athlete. You know, I don't, I never wanted to be, maybe it's just a function of what I like to do, but I love running. Um, you know, I've been running off and on my whole life. Um, and I love outdoor adventures and, you know, I'm always trying to balance it in there with, you know, other, with, you know, my work career and my family, but, but I just love movement. I love being outdoors. I love using my body that way. I love fitness. I love run, running, especially trail running is such an awesome blend of, kind of adrenaline but flow it's being in nature it's it's moving your body it's challenge i like the i like that particular challenge of the terrain and and you know the i the hills i like climbing i kind of like rocks um but i like speed too so i'm kind of like a blend of a lot of things you know i i think over the course of if you want to call it like ultra running career really for me like what stands out is just kind of like doing the whole spectrum you know, I've really enjoyed, I, I could go back to like my 2019 season where, 
you know, in 2019, I finished 400 milers, um, all on trail, but I also did an Ironman and I ran some like road five Ks. And, you know, for me, like that really sums up, you know, what I do, it's hard to, it's kind of hard to do that. I think, you know, you need to have some somewhat special adaptations to do that because you're not ever specifically training for any one thing. Um, but you're, there are some like general aspects to your training that are always there, you know? So for me, like probably I would consider myself, you know, a trail ultra runner. I'm a trail ultra runner, but you know, I'll run like faster things on the road. I've, I've run Boston marathon a couple times. Um, you know, I've, I've run really any kind of ultra from road or trail 50 Ks all the way up to, you know, 24 hour events and trail hundreds and, I just kind of enjoy all of that. You know, I never really wanted to, to quote, like focus on any one specific thing and be like, well, I'm, I'm only going to run, you know, hundreds or I'm only going to run 50 Ks or, or, you know, I'm only going to run trail or I'm only going to run road or I'm only going to run track. I've just, I've just, I think enjoyed. And I, I think I always will enjoy just that versatility and kind of what's inspiring me at the moment, how I feel, you know, what, what I can plan for, but what I can jump into and just kind of really just enjoy the ride and practice gratitude and, you know, all that stuff. So that's kind of like what I am. I feel like I'm a blend of all that. <laughs> I like it. Give us a couple of your favorite races you've run. Yes. Yeah, wow. So um, let's, let me think about it. I mean, what stands out in my mind um Man, there've been there've been a lot over the years. Um, I'll always go back to, you know, I love. Well, let me say this first of all. I love the Pretzel City Sports races, which are kind of like my hometown um, racing here. They're based out of Reading. Um, they're run by Ron and Helene Horn, who are really good friends of mine. It's a lot of trail events. They put on Labor Pain, which is I think probably one of the largest twelve-hour. Uh, probably one of the largest ultras in the country. And it's a 12 hour race um, in Reading. And, and it's based out of the Liederkranz, which is a German um, sports club out there in Reading by the Pagoda. And, um, and that's kind of cool. It's like a, about a five mile loop in the woods there. Um, so that's a lot of fun. And I do a lot of their races though. I mean, like, you know, they have races all year round, 10 Ks, 15 Ks and things like that. So I've really, enjoyed those races over the years um for 100 milers i mean something that just stands out in my mind because it was super epic um especially coming from sea level and finishing it is the bear 100 which goes from utah to idaho um I'm sure you're familiar with that so i was fortunate enough to finish the bear um in 2013 and i finished it in like 29 hours i really wanted to be below 30 and so that was kind of cool and I'll just never forget it. I mean, I just, I, I do love it out West. I just try to get out there at least once a year, if not a few times more. So that was pretty epic. I, I ran the bear last year as well. And I DNF'd at like mile 60 something, um, which was, you know, I mean, I mean, I've got a ton of ultra finishes and I also have a ton of, not really a ton, a lot less, but you know, over the past 10 or over years, you know, some ultra DNFs too, which are always tough where, you know, you DNF, but it was actually an ultra. <laughs> no, you I know, know. that was my Scion last on. year. Yeah. I did I did Scion 100 and I DNF'd at uh, mile 70. Right, right. Yeah. Right, so right there, you know, that's over 100k, so that's a pretty good chunk, but um so the bear, I just I love it because I, you know, I I like that just the, that vastness, those those big mountains kind of like stokes my imagination in that adventure, you know, but it's tough to trained specifically for that kind of thing that's probably you know maybe a topic for another podcast but so that was epic um for fast races i haven't done it recently but um my fastest 50k was at a course called the Comset park 50k which is a 5k road loop um on long island new york um and i that was like my pr back in 2016 so i just i guess i feel like i have good memories of that because it all kind of clicked and i ran fast there um, there's a race that I've been doing the past couple of years, which is in Virginia, Prince William Forest Park, and it's put on by a friend of mine, um, and it's called Devil Dog 100, and they have 100K, and it's at Prince William Forest Park. It's similar trails to, like, what I run here, um, 
So that just has a really good vibe and it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun people. Um, and it's the trails there are pretty similar to like what I, what I run here. So those are, those are probably some that I could just like, think of. I, I, I love it because you introduced us to a whole bunch of new races and a different way of thinking about races because so yeah. often when you sit here on the West Coast and you, you talk to people who have lots of experience, you know, they just say Western States, right? They, they sort of say the, the obvious races that everybody expects. And so it was just right. nice to hear to hear yeah. some some new races because... You know, we are in a time when our sport is growing so much and there is some consolidation happening and stuff. And I think we sometimes forget that there are dozens and dozens of little and big races yeah. that are independent or they have their own race series and they might not have the big sponsors attacked or the big, you know, pros are not coming out so there's no coverage on them, but they are absolutely fantastic events, um, challenging, yeah. great atmosphere, and they just they just are there for the community, and they will yeah. be there, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so um, biggest fail? Um, man, let me. Um, I I would say hmm. that's a mean biggest, one, right? Biggest fail? Yeah, I I think I'm just trying to make sure I, I'm accurate on it. Yeah, I would probably say last year's the Bear 100. I was kind of kicking myself on that one. You know, it was one of those where, and again, that's like, I probably should have, I think I was, we moved, I mean, you can always make a ton of excuses, right? I think I just allowed my overall life vibe fatigue <laughs> to kind of, um, kind of get into my, into the race there. And I just, I didn't have the race that I was hoping to have. And it, it was one of those where I probably could have and should have just pressed on. And I just kind of allowed myself to say, like, not having the race I really want to have here. It's not panning out as I wanted to. I'm just kind of, like, tired and I'm done. And, you know, and that happens. It does happen sometimes. Luckily, that hasn't happened for me a whole lot. Or I've been able to just, you know, press through that and turn things around um, when when you think things aren't going your way. But... I mean, we're all human and every now and again, you know, you just can't rally yourself. And I think that was my issue uh, there last year. I think that's, you know, you said we, we make a lot of excuses. I, I want to take offense to that a little bit. <laughs> you you were there. This is your story. I'm not, I'm not telling you to, that you were wrong. But it is important. I just had a conversation with someone and I asked them about their training plan. And how accurately sort of they write down their training stuff. And I asked them, I was yeah. like, do you in your training diary journal reflect like difficult challenges that are real life challenges that are not affecting, that, that are not just about your physical feeling and your, the, your, your gear performance or so, right? Because, yeah, if we have outside forces that have an impact on our life, and, and sometimes they actually are more important because running is sort of a big luxury that we are, that we are yeah. just, you know, uh, affording yeah. us. And, I mean, I, those things are real, right? I think the yeah. first time yeah. that hit me, you were saying you were moving. I, um, I ran Squamish 50 Miler a few years ago, and... Um, we we had to move fairly sudden in in our rental and um i and that was like three weeks before the race and and there was wildfire smoke on the west so training was really hard and difficult and then at race day halfway through race i had i gotten back pain and i was like i've never gotten back pain and i realized <laughs> it was because i was I, I had completely adjusted my training i spent i couldn't train much and i essentially moved our entire house and on race day it was coming back to remind me right and i was able to finish but not on the level that i wanted to and so i think it's important that we acknowledge those things right we are not yeah. machines these things are they do have an effect on us that's true. No, absolutely. You know, I've always felt like, you know, notwithstanding my training plan or my or my zone, a lot of times I race best when when life is otherwise in a good spot. You know, and I think that's just a function of, you know, 
being a husband, being a father, having a, you know, a job where people otherwise, you know, rely on you and stuff. And, and, you know, can you just kind of block stuff out and clear your mind and focus, you know, and put that focus in to pursue that, that, you know, as you said, luxury. Um, but, you know, and that's in some ways it's, I don't know if it's just as important as training, but it's definitely important. But, um, but I always try to remind myself in those times too, like in life, you know, a lot of times it's bigger than, than we think it is, you know, and there are a lot of people, including ourselves. And I feel like I've always felt like I'm a better person for doing this, you know, and, and that I can be an inspiration to other people too, in different ways, in whatever aspect it is in their life, um, to get out there and pursue goals and, you know, lead an active lifestyle and pursue adventure and break away from, you know, materialism and the rat race of just daily life. And so in those, in those ways, you can kind of like, you know, remind yourself that, you know, you're, you're a part of something that's inspirational and gives a lot of people a lot of joy. Yeah. And, yeah. and these, these goals that we, we, we're setting as much as it's disappointing for us, if we don't achieve them and we have to work through that mm -hmm. um, emotional setback, if you will. Right. But to the people around us, like I've, only experienced dnfs for the first time last year because i've yeah. never set audacious goals like that but the people around me don't see me as a failure for having tried something and failed right i mean yep. if, if, if you're speaking about being an inspiration and sort of aspiring to sort of create something for others too right it's like it's towing the starting line and putting the training in and attempting something um that's what's aspiring you know it, the people yeah. especially people who don't run they don't care if you come in 50th or fifth or um, fail halfway through because you realize something is off right they yeah. appreciate it that you've tried that's right and that's such a great lesson for life i mean that you just said people appreciate that you've tried i mean you know this is uh trying and doing your best and setting big goals and dreaming big. I mean, those are just great life lessons and, you know, it carries over. That's why I'm such a huge fan of endurance and endurance athletes, Matthias. <laughs> it is, no, it is true. Right. I think that there is something there, there is something said about how life prepares you to be able to do these kind of sports, but then these sports then in return prepare you back for, for life. Yeah, I've always felt I've always felt that as challenge. See, for me, I'm like kind of one of those people that I I really enjoy training. Like I just, I just do. Like I I just I don't know. I just didn't, I really enjoy it. And so yeah, there are times when like it's kind of a grind. As as for everybody, it's like a grind. You know, the weather's exceptionally terrible, or I'm just like you know having a crappy day or whatever. And so I don't really want to put my miles in. But that's like not the norm. Usually, I like look forward to to my running and whatever other training I'm doing, but it's more, um, you know, like, can, can you, can you get it done with all the other obligations that you have? And, you know, that's definitely part of my story too, with having, you know, a full-time job and a family. And so sometimes that's the frustrating thing where you're like, I really want to get this, you know, my 10 or 12 miles in today on a weekday, um, you know, and it's tough to do it. Do I need to break it up into two runs or how am I going to, do I need to run, you know, at 10 PM or for me, it's usually later than earlier. Sometimes it's earlier, but I'm more of, I tend to be more on the later side, but you know, how do we do it? And sometimes it's frustrating. And I feel like, you know, it can, it can be energy taking, but I've always felt, I've always felt that on balance, it's like not even a question that, you know, endurance and ultra running has always given me back so much more than any kind of you know trials or tribulations associated with it oh that's that's a very good sentiment that is that is true yeah. it is it's yeah. worth it's worth the fight right and yeah and sometimes you know let's admit it sometimes it's just a fight but in the aggregate and there's the big life lesson too right that is if we fight through the hard stuff we get to the good stuff, but it's also that that endurance. It's that, that's that right. rhythm that that creates something that's bigger than than the sum of the parts, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, all right. So, twenty twenty two. What's on the race calendar for you? Yeah. What's so, coming up? Uh, yep. 
similar to that theme. So I have a, I have a 10 K super local at that Tyler Arboretum, um, in about two weeks. Um, and that'll be a short kind of hilly fast race. We get a lot of fast people at that race. Um, and then, and then at the end of April, uh, the CNO 100, which I'm pretty psyched about. It'll be my third time there. I have one finish, which was, that was like my hundred mile PR in 1921 and then one DN, 70 mile DNF. So that'll be my third time there. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. I can tell you about that course too, if you've never heard of that one. No, no, yeah, please do. Absolutely. Yeah. So the CNO, um, again, like that's probably one that maybe some folks on the West coast haven't heard of, but, um, it is in Maryland and, um, it's run like on, it starts from like a camp kind of up on these cliffs and you run down trail to this towpath along a canal and you just basically like run out and run back for, they call it like kind of like a loop, but it's really like an out up the canal back the other way on the canal and then back to the camp, um, two or three times um and then and do that again numerous times for 100 miles um it's like maybe three or two three or four loops something like that i think they change the number of times you go to the camp but in any event that's where that is and the canal is near the it's along the potomac river there in maryland so it's just kind of like near um i'm gonna say like harper's ferry which uh you may have heard of and it's kind of like at the point um yeah, this is great because I can fill you in on this. It's kind of like at the point where um, West Virginia and Virginia and Maryland all kind of like intersect there. Um, and uh, although the, although the race doesn't cross into that. And so so it's largely flat on the towpath, but over the course of like 100 miles and going up and down to the camp, you probably get like two to 3,000 feet of gain. So it's really for 100 milers, you know, and it's all on dirt. I don't know if you'd really call it like a trail hundred miles. It's, it's kind of, you know, you're on trail going up and back from the camp and then you're on like a towpath, like a dirt gravel towpath. So for hundred milers, that's, you know, as you know, on the, on the lower end of vertical gain spectrum, it's definitely not double digit gain, but it's not completely flat. It's pretty fast course. Um, the towpath drains pretty well. I would say that that type of like footing is similar to what I've experienced on the West coast, a little sandier, a little more like finer rocks and gravel. It's really not like a rocky course except for the trail um, up and down from the camp. But yeah, you just run out and back on the towpath and, and hit it for, for a hundred miles and you can kind of cruise. There are just aid stations along the way. And uh, you know, it's nice to just zone out, not the canal area. It's in, it's in April. So things are kind of budding, um, especially down there in that like mid Atlantic region. It can be cool. Um, you know, when I did it in 2019, it was, it got cold. It, we had, we had some rain, it got colder, but it was warm during the day. So it was kind of like shorts and like a t-shirt or a lot or a light long sleeve. And then at night with the colder rain and you're kind of like depleted, I think I put a jacket on. Um, but yeah, so that, that should be good. And, you know, it's a faster race. I'm always, you know, hills and vert are kind of like a staple of my, training um so but and i and i would keep and i keep doing that even though like cno you know you don't really need a lot of vert to train for the cno 100 but you know tying it back to your like virtual challenge you know time on your feet is really important so that was you know a decent four to five hour effort with 23 miles and i think that was probably for me like part of like a 80 something mile week which is all great training for for a race like that and then because I have like some shorter, faster things, you know, I've been mixing in like one day of speed work on a track, um, but still keeping, you know, my hill kind of like focus on her. I think, you know, probably like last, last week, um, let's see, like last week I might've done like maybe four to 5,000 feet of gain you know, over like 60 something miles. So a little less than a hundred feet per mile, but which is fine for CNO. But if I were like, if it were back to something like the bear or something in your neck of the woods coming up, I'd, I'd up the vert a little bit more, but you know, you don't need to do that for something like CNO. So yeah, so that's, what's on my immediate radar. And then I've got like some, I'm sure I'll jump into some things. I like to kind of keep some things open. Sometimes the kids, 
June is kind of a tough time for me just because of the end of the school year. And I've got some like fun summer adventures maybe planned with some friends um, and then some races maybe I'm looking at in the fall. Cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was I was um, talking to some trail runners in Germany and there, you know, Germans have a word for everything. They sort of define <laughs> um, a difference between a trail race and then they what they call sort of an overland race. So it is okay. an ultra distance, but it is not really what what they would consider trail is sort of single track, right? Single it's track, right. Rudy and stuff, right? Where we we call a trail race anything that's not really on a road, but what right. you're sort of describing um, with that race, it would be more more sort of an overland race, if you will. Right. right. It's right. it's not road, but it's not really like gnarly single track. So I, right, I, for I, sure. I like yeah. That. yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. So that that means you have a fairly open schedule because there are some people who, um, and I think it has something to do with. If, if you are trying to get into races that sell out and you know need a, yeah. you know lottery or whatever for then you plan your year out a little bit more yeah. you seem to have sort of your year open and you see what comes up you know that's but it's interesting you say that because that i think i don't know if it'll always it wasn't always that way and that might just be like recently i don't even know if it was you know, I think this year that seems to be working for me. Um, but there, there have definitely been years where I planned it out and then I planned all of my training for the year around all of those races. Um, and that's not to say I would never do that again, but I think, like you said, unless you're, unless you have to get into a race where there was like a lottery and it was like, you know, a year before, or it was going to sell out and you really wanted to do it, you know, there's something kind of cool about, just like being trained and having some races on the radar that you might do, but not locking yourself in so that you're, and I think that in some ways that, you know, can work well with life in general too. And I've, I've just tried to be mindful of it because, you know, I, I think it's been a little weird post COVID and pandemic and stuff. And especially with kids and, you know, our kids are 14 and 11 and, they're really active with sports and, you know, they're in, they're in a bunch of sports and I kind of help coach not too much. Be, I really can't do it too much, but um, I've helped out a little bit like where I can. And so I've just tried to be mindful of like the rhythm of those of life in that regard. And if, like you said, if you're locked into a number of races, like I can block things out to, to, to not just the training, but like to be around for that race. But if you have too much blocked out, And then light, you, you might almost feel like too much pressure with what you've got to rearrange to get to those things. And so, so sometimes I've found over the years, it's good to, it can be good to have like a big plan, but then it can also be good to kind of have more of like a training plan, but a little more openness with what events you have and just be, be like, Hey, you know, I feel trained, um, in this zone. I think I could do X, Y, or Z race and this race is open and I'm just going to kind of like jump in. Yeah, I I think, I mean, it speaks back to to the the fact that our running is is luxury, right? I mean, we we yeah. need to have our priorities straight, and if we're too much Type A and plan everything only yep. yeah. um, that is about us, I've, I've enjoyed in previous years to sort of have a summer race during yep. vacation where I can travel with the family. Yeah, and I do a race, and perhaps my wife does a distance um, on on that uh, you know festival, running festival too. Or so, um, yeah. but then we sort of add some vacation with the family. That sometimes worked, right. but yeah, I mean the training and everything, and you know, I mean, I've got kids almost the same age as yours, yeah. mine. I'm a little bit older, but I mean they go through phases and they need different things at different times, and you yeah. you need to adjust yeah. that. I've had, it's funny you mentioned that. I mean, I've had so many, so many runs on vacations where I would like, I'll tell you like some funny stories, like generally just, you know, run to meet the family at dinner, you know, or, oh, amazing. or yeah. you know, or, you know, like somebody would just bring me a change of clothes and I would, you know, just run to whatever event we were instead of driving there, go to, and this way I could both, you know, be at that event and get my run in or whatever, you know? Yeah. One of my favorite runs I've ever done was waking up really early we were with, 
we were with family and friends at Yosemite and during my um, birthday happened during the time we were down there and I woke up really early while everybody's sleeping and I just ran, I don't know, five, six miles up um, a trail up to Vernal Falls or whatever it's called up there and um, it was just amazing and I came back down and everybody was up and um, ready for breakfast and I'm like ah, I got my run in didn't kill myself let's let's celebrate my birthday (laughs) yeah that's a good day (laughs) yeah yeah, it was was amazing so this podcast often talks about um, fastest known times and sort of coming up with routes that you that are not races that are adventure runs where you might be training for might be chasing an fkt or might be creating something is that something that you play with is on your radar you enjoy doing no i would have to you know not really an fkt i haven't i haven't really dabbled in the fkt kind of on my radar as like a as like a goal um but you know but Running our own ultras for sure is something that I that I do. I hope to do more of it in Vermont now that we have the condo up there, um, and and our condo our condo is like right off the Appalachian Trail. So um, last year, a buddy of mine and I did you know like a kind of like a weekend festival of running where we did you know double digit runs for a couple of days and did a, did our own fifty k. Um, I've done like a just a bunch of you know fifty k forty mile type runs with friends, um, just just for training purposes and fun. I haven't really done a targeted FKT. I I don't know that like that I'm thinking about doing that right now, but that's not to say that I would never never do it. I think like right now I'm I'm kind of like in this zone of of a hybrid of putting some races on the map and then just training and being able to jump into other things. Is that, um, is it easy for you to find good routes? I mean, you know, it is easy if you know your environment, but that's what in some respects, these FKT um, sort of efforts are sort of help you too, right? Even if you're like, okay, I'm, I'm never going to be uh, breaking an FKT on this because there are way too fast runners out there. Um, but at least it gives me something that I know. Hey, look, I should yeah. run this route or whatever, right? It, yeah, I haven't yeah. thought of that. And I know people are kind of like creative with their FKTs too, you know, in terms of like, you know, making their own route or kind of picking a segment of something that might not be, you know, super, super competitive, Um Honestly, I think it's probably just something that hasn't been like that I just haven't focused on. But mm-hmm. you know, that's not to say I might not ever focus on it. <laughs> it you know, there, there is there are no wrong answers here, but it, it's been something that I've enjoyed because I enjoy the part of finding routes. Like I love yeah. my Strava route builder. I love pouring over maps and, right, and right. Com- combining routes, or even if they don't end up being an FKT. But like yeah. in my town, you know, Olympia is 45,000 people. So it's not a big city. And then we've got two cities, sort of tri-city left and right from it. So it ends up being 120,000 sort of um, metropolitan yeah. area, everywhere, which is not big, right? But we've got lots of little city parks. And I love mm-hmm. sort of coming up with a route that combines as many parks and you just start from your house and you're not just running road, right? You go, okay, I'm running from one place to one park and running some trails through that park coming out the other end and running to the next park right sort of like that whole route building is something that yeah. i love doing immensely and i think that's where that leads then to oh could this could be an fkt route yeah, or perhaps yeah. this is already if i adjust it just ever so slightly so well, that, yeah that's cool Sp- spoken like a true uh, race director <laughs> it is very much so i yeah. do i do love myself some some route uh, route finding and creating yeah. and stuff like that for sure yeah, yeah well, cool. well awesome so yeah so let's talk a little bit you are sponsored by some brands why don't you give some shout outs to your brands that are su- supporting you and then we yeah. can add some links and show notes and stuff yeah cool very cool i mean i'll i'll shout out first to hammer nutrition um, they've supported me for, you know, a number of years and that's a really good relationship because, 
you know, fueling is really important. Um, I love, I love their hammer gel, obviously, but I use a lot of their supplements. Um, I use recover, right. All the endure lights and electrolyte products. Um, and then some of the recovery products too, protein powder and, you know, CoQ10 blends that they have and stuff. So, so that's really important. And I, I love the people over there. Um, and happy to talk about like their ethos just in general with nutrition. Cause I like their like focus on lower sugar, lower salt, you know, healthy kind of lifestyle. So, yeah, it's, so, yeah. In, it's interesting. I'm, um, I'm sponsored. I'm a, a ambassador for, for tailwind and uh, somebody just pointed me to hammer and saying, and kind of gave, gave that breakdown of what they are focusing on. And it is a little bit different to Tailwind, which is right. interesting because for me with Tailwind, I love it. It works for me, but I'm not a big nutritionist researcher that I'm like, oh, I've been struggling with this for 15 years and I've tried every product on the market, right? It's like, yeah. no, you know, I've tried Tailwind, Tailwind works, it's fine. How, what do you think? are sort of the key things that you love about Hammer. Yeah, so that, that's a great, I mean, I could talk for a long time about that. You know, I, I think so overall, I, I can't preach enough. You know, when people ask me, like, how do you, how have you, been? I mean, I've been like relatively, thankfully, you know, pretty strong over the years and, and without like major injuries and stuff. And I just have to believe that it's probably a combination of a lot of things, but one of the factors would be just good overall nutrition. That's not to say like never like eat some pizza, drink a beer, have ice cream for sure. I mean, I, I do that too. Um, that, that sounds but, like all good, good nutrition to me. Yeah, that's right. You know, cal <laughs> well, you know, you need calories for these right. types of efforts, but, but, you know, but you also need like salad and vegetables and plants and things like that. And, you know, try to limit processed food and chemicals and, and junk, especially like in day-to-day -day living. And they definitely preach that, you know, like to their athletes and in broader, on the broader spectrum in their newsletters and stuff. Um, and I think that the ingredients in their products kind of reflect that too. So, you know, but even, you know, so like I, I'm pretty religious about after a run, you know, drinking some kind of like recovery shake, um, you know, maybe like with potassium, like coconut, uh, water, almond milk, and like some of their Recoverite blends, um, drinking protein, making sure I get enough protein. In addition to carbs, I think a lot of runners overlook protein for rebuilding. Um, a ton of fruits and vegetables, you know, just randomly sat like salad. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of a big salad at least once a day, just putting things in there. Um, nuts, you know, almonds, walnuts and things. So, but hammer, I mean, I love hammer gel. I love their nocella. I love their, um, Montana huckleberry. Um, I love their mango fizz, um, you know, stuff like that. And, and, you know, in racing, um, my coach was always been like a big fan of gels, you know, in racing. And so I kind of like adopted that. And so I kind of, this way I can separate to, to your point, you know, and tell, and I have nothing bad to say about Tailwind for sure. And I know plenty of people who use it and are sponsored by them, but, um, but I kind of like the ability to separate out my calories and my electrolytes and my fluid this way, you know, I know like, you know, just on a bare minimum, have I gotten my calories this hour or at this time period, have I consumed enough fluid? Have I taken salt? Um, and if they're all together and I'm like not drinking, then maybe then I'm not getting any of it. But if I micro adjust it, then I can, even if I'm not drinking as much or I'm, or I was drinking a little too much, I can up the salt or up, you know, take an extra gel or whatever. And I can just, I just have found for me that I can manage it better then. Yeah. So that's what, yeah. No, that's great. I think that's, that's good. I'm, I, I love hearing what works for different people because di different people, different training, different I mean, even just like seasonal temperature changes, right? I mean, so yeah. much can, can have an impact on runners and you find something that works for you. And it's, it's, it's good to share these stories of what makes sense, what works. You don't want to, yeah. you don't want to be stuck in a rut of like, this is the only thing. Then, um, well, number one, then from a voice who records podcasts, you sort of become um, very inauthentic but also just in general i think it's important to kind of to see what's out there so that's great yeah so that's that and then also ultraspire which um is a sponsor of mine and they're they're super cool too i love the the ethos of that company which is you know basically like outdoor adventure lifestyle 
Um, and, you know, they make packs, obviously, as you know, and hydration systems. Um, and, kind, you know, I think one of the benefits of being an ultra spire athlete is you can kind of have a little bit more uh, ready access to different types of packs and systems for different types of races, you know, because like a race like the bear um, would require like one type of pack. But, you know, a system for something like CNO 100 would require a different type of pack, you know, and so and I but I just even more so than that, I just kind of like, you know, their their family um, outdoor adventure, you know, gear for outdoor adventure mentality and their their ethos in that regard. So so that's pretty cool. Yeah. So shout out to them. And their stuff is really top notch. It's really well made. It lasts forever. And, you know, it's made by an inspired to their motto inspired by athletes so it's made with those you know that that what athletes needs are in mind and you know what they would need in the mountains what they would need for endurance training and stuff like that yeah that's great i love hearing the stories behind the companies who make the products i'm not a big fan i often review products here on the podcast that um gear companies sending me and it's always hard yep. for me to review something number one you don't have a lot of time to review it and especially our endurance gear really right. you really only know if it's good if you have used it for a year right and then there's so uh, many different sure. like side cases of what works for somebody doesn't work for another and so hearing the story of the company who the founders of the families behind it and stuff i think yeah. that speaks volume and goes beyond yeah. I mean, it can't overshadow the, the product still needs to work but yes. i think those are the, the, the it's it's super important especially in our over corporatized world right yeah and that's you know that's interesting like in, in ultra running in general you know because it's i think ultra running's trying to walk that line between you know, some good things that can come out of that, especially with, um, you know, um, giving the broader world awareness of endurance and, and outdoor adventure and fun, but also, you know, ultra trail running is its own niche too still. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's similar to, but it's different from like a road racing event, you know? And so, you know, you've, some of my favorite, like I've had some, a lot of fun at some really big kind of more quote corporate races, but I've also had some of my best memories have been, you know, 30 people in the woods with a bonfire and you're running for half the day, you know, and that, that kind of like down home gritty, just, you know, we're out here because we love it mentality is is i think still at, and should be at the is at the heart and the core of trail ultra running so it very cool. much is um i just took over race directing for a race that's been happening now for 11 12 years it's called the beast of big creek and it's um how many half marathons or the one half is up the mountain the other half is down it's over five thousand feet of gain and goes up from big creek campground by lake cushman on the olympic mountains up to the summit of mount eleanor and back down and it's wow. super technically technical on top um especially on a downhill it's really challenging because it's yeah. a sort of a hiking almost climbing route and um yeah it's a super small race and yeah. very niche very challenging very different so if you if if you want to really challenge yourself the beauty is it doesn't have any altitude right because it right. starts more or less at sea level it starts at 800 feet so you go only go up to 5500 or something yeah. um and so uh, you 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 don't have to worry about the air being thin but if right. you want a, a really, really challenging mountain race on a short distance, then. And the beauty is that the race is being held completely, you know, as you say, bonfire in the woods type deal. So, yeah, I'm super excited about that one. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Come well, check it out. Lou, um, where can people reach out to you? Do you want to send some links to um, our audience if they find themselves on the east coast um to yeah. in, in need of a running buddy or want to know about some of the races you mentioned yeah sure i'd say you know i mean i'm i'm on facebook i it's not 
like a like a huge it's kind of like a, a circle of people i know or runners and stuff but you know where i i tend to have some connection one way or another to people in the running community so you know I'm on facebook under lou d'onofrio and uh there's a, a photo of me on a trail um if they wanted to reach out that way that's totally cool um strava i don't i'm not always on, i don't always post on strava but i have a strava account um that's cool too and just you know, message me. And if people messaged me or whatever that way, then I could definitely send them my, uh, my email address or cell phone number and, and we could link up. It, it's awesome when people come out here from other places or when, when I'm out in other places and meeting up with people, like you said, from East coast or West coast, it's just, I think it's a really great thing. So that'd be awesome. Fantastic. Lou, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the stories from, from the East Coast. You made it yeah. sound all very, very enticing and exciting. You know, I've lived now for over 20 years in this country, but I've only, almost only been here on the West Coast. I, I feel sort of bummed that I haven't been had the chance to explore more. So, well. um we're going to change that, Matthias. You're going to come out here and, you know, I'll, I can, there are so many places uh, up and down, for me at least, mid-Atlantic up to New England where we could get you some good single track trail time. I, I love it. Well, I mean, you know, you mentioned pretzel races. I feel like as a German, I should come over and, and run uh, run a pretzel race. What was that called? What was the I racing think you company? Have pretzel city sports i think you absolutely should man. pretzel city sports this is like i'm so jealous of that name <laughs> i should have run my named my race racing you, company pretzel you, city sports it's amazing <laughs> you would fit, you would fit right in there my my friend i love this <laughs> okay all right lou thank you so much thanks so much matthias i had a great time talking to you